Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD. Um, it's a webinar series about Lyme disease. Uh, you get to ask questions, and I hope I can provide good answers for you. So these webinars are never identical. So each week is a little bit different, and it's determined by the questions you ask. Uh, it's in the middle of summer here, so we'll have to see what kind of a turnout we have tonight. I know we had uh, a good number of people sign up, uh, but I often find that uh, we don't have many show <laughs> in the middle of summer like this, or not as many as we do in the winter time. So it may be possible that for those of you that are here, I may at some point say, ask another question. We may have room for that tonight. Um, the way that these webinars work for those of you that are new here is you create them with your questions and you can write your questions to me through the chat box that's over on the right hand side of the screen down here at the bottom all right uh, when you write that question i ask that you do not hit the enter key until the whole question is complete if you do hit the enter key before the question is complete it actually creates a separate question on my end so I, I, if you hit enter each time you hit enter it creates a different question on my side and it gets very difficult for me to follow as I'm trying to create responses for you. I am doing a recording of the webinar tonight. And tomorrow morning, uh, probably around 6.30 or so in the morning, Seattle time, uh, which is 9.30 in the morning, East Coast time, uh, I will send an email out to you letting you know that the recording is done and that I have posted it at the website, the, the Treat Lyme book site, which is www.treatlime.net. So for those of you that uh, happen to miss something tonight, just realize that there will be a recorded version of this that will go out tomorrow, okay? And then um, during the course of the webinar tonight, I am going to um, uh, create uh, or show you uh, some um, uh, parts of our website. And I just realized I forgot to pull the website up. So bear with me here for just a minute. So I'll be doing some screen shares where I can show you some of the resources that we have available um, at uh, treatlime.net, which is also called the Treatline book. Okay. So it will be showing you where you can find information. So if you happen to not be able to hear it well enough and you want to have places where you can read it, you'll be able to do that. Finally, uh, for those of you that are participating in the webinar tonight, uh, you will actually be able to see the, the questions um, as I'm reading them. I do post them on the screen. Unfortunately, they don't show up in the recorded version, so I will be reading them so others can hear, especially for those that are listening to the recorded version later on. This is the first of three weeks that I'm going to be doing these webinars. So um, at the end of the webinar tonight, I, I will take you over to treatlime.net where you can sign up for the next one, okay? So feel free to join me um, as many times as you can over the next few weeks too. And with that, I don't think I have anything else to say here in advance. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the first question here. Hello, Eric. Um, Aloha, Dr. Ross. Uh, my wife's MCV has been slowly rising over the last year. It's at 104.7. And the reference range for what it normally is, is 80 to 100. She takes a lot of methyl B vitamins, any other causes, a clarithromycin. Is this dangerous? Mahalo for your help. All right. So everyone, MCV uh, are, is a, a set of initials, but what it stands for is uh, something called mean corpuscular volume. Now, that's a mouthful too. Uh, what that is, that's the size of your red blood cells. And we look at the size of the red blood cells. If red blood cells get large, it sometimes can indicate a vitamin deficiency. And the two vitamin deficiencies that it can sometimes indicate are vitamin B12 or the vitamin folate. So one thing that your wife ought to be sure, and even though she's taking methyl B vitamins, which usually means she's getting B12 and usually means she is getting folate, your doctors, her doctors should still actually do a measurement of B12 in the blood and also a folate. And the reason they should still do a measurement is there is an occasional person that when you take B12 orally, it doesn't get absorbed. And that is because some of us lack a protein made in the stomach called intrinsic factor. And we need to make intrinsic factor in our stomach. It binds to B12 and then increases its absorption. And there are some people that are not able to make that chemical called intrinsic factor. So the first step to see is to make sure that they check a vitamin B12 level. Now, they may have already done that, but also check a folate level as well, too, okay? 
in addition, there are, if those are normal, it is possible some medications uh, in some people can lead to increased size of the red blood cells. And then finally, sometimes it can happen that you get increased red blood cells as just part of chronic illness, not necessarily from Lyme, but just from having chronic illness, okay? Now, I do not think of clarithromycin, which I think you wrote here, as being a specific cause for the increased size of the red blood cells, but anything is possible. So anyhow, where I would um, steer you towards, Eric, is to make sure that you do have the, your wife's uh, vitamin B12 level checked and also a chemical called folate, the vitamin folate uh, level checked as well too. There isn't any inherent harm in having big red blood cells, okay? But it can sometimes indicate another underlying problem that you wanna correct for, with, like the B12 and like the folate. All right, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, many of you may hear there sounds to be a sound blowing in the background. Um, that's my air conditioner unit. We actually finally got summer here in Seattle while I was gone last week. And that's good. But when that happens, I have to run my air conditioner. And I, I think I have the world's loudest air conditioner unit. So you will hear it uh, turn on and off periodically. And it is pretty loud. <laughs> so that noise blowing in the background is my air conditioner unit. All right. So let me go ahead and move on here. Eric, thank you for that question. And, uh, and good luck to your wife, too. All right, next question is from Deborah. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm currently taking uh, Bandaron Cemento and Hutunia and Siddha Akuda. That's what Hoot and Siddha means, everyone. Hutunia and Siddha Akuda for Lyme and Bartonella. I've been taking Biaxin for over a year and want to stop it without having a major inflammatory response. How would you recommend how would you recommend slowly decreasing it i take curcumin and do all the steps you have in the treat line book i had a bad reaction when stopping the biaxin six months ago so would appreciate your help thanks okay so everyone biaxin is an antibiotic many of you know that treats Lyme. Um, it's also called clarithromycin the generic name of it is called clarithromycin it is useful for treating intracellular Lyme and spirochete Lyme. And for those of you that may not know, um, Lyme actually exists in you in three different forms, okay? So there's the corkscrew looking thing that many of you seen before, that's called the spirochete. Um, also, it moves inside of cells, we call that intracellular Lyme or L form Lyme is another name for that. And then finally, there is a, a microscopic cyst form of the germ as well too, okay? Um, so, um, the biaxin slash clarithromycin is useful at treating intracellular Lyme and treating spirochete Lyme, and it does so by blocking protein production of the germ, so the germ basically withers and dies, okay? It can't grow without having adequate proteins, and it will wither and die. Now, biaxin, just like any other prescription antibiotic, also has an anti-inflammatory effect, separate from its ability to kill Lyme germs. Um, other antibiotics can do that too. For instance, the tetracyclines, minocycline, and, uh, and doxycycline have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and so it is possible that if it is benefiting you by, as an anti-inflammatory, that stopping it could trigger more inflammation. Now, the one thing I would say is if you've been treated for an additional six months for Lyme, Lyme triggering inflammation may be decreased. The chances of Lyme triggering inflammation may be decreased. So therefore, this time that you come off the biaxin, you may find it to be a lot easier to come off than the last time. Having said that, the main things I would do to help ease coming off of it is to be on good anti-inflammatories. So I like the curcumin that you're taking. Everyone, many of you may know, curcumin is one of the big things I recommend in my Lyme disease treatments. Um, it is a very good anti-inflammatory. It decreases inflammation chemicals uh, made by the immune system when somebody has Lyme. Those are called cytokines. And it's cytokines that give you most of your Lyme disease symptoms, okay? So when we say somebody has Lyme disease symptoms, actually what they really have are too many cytokine symptoms. They're made by white blood cells. They give you most of their Lyme symptoms. And curcumin, which comes from the seasoning turmeric, the Indian seasoning turmeric, that's what gives Indian food its yellow color, Curcumin is a great anti-cytokine agent, okay? So Deborah, one of the things that you might wanna do uh, getting ready to prepare to come off your biaxin is maximize the benefit of that curcumin. Uh, and the way you would maximize it 
is increase it up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day. Many of you may know from my Lyme disease treatment protocol called the successful treatment recipe that you can find at treatlyme.net, my Lyme disease information site, Many of you know that I do recommend curcumin as a means of lowering cytokines as part of your treatment. And so it's a very important thing. Deborah, the other thing you might want to consider doing um, is adding another anti-cytokine treatment. And that would be to use um, something, uh, a brown seaweed extract, which is uh, also called Eclonia cava. That's E-C-K-L-O-N-I-A second word kava, um, C-A-V-A, okay, Eclonia kava. Eclonia kava is brown seaweed extract, very strong antioxidant. And as a strong antioxidant, it also works to decrease cytokines, okay, through a different mechanism than what the curcumin does. So you can get an added benefit. So Eclonia kava is also sold as a product called FibroBoost. And the way that I would wind up doing it is to use it as two pills twice a day. So Fiber Boost, which is known as Eclonia Cava, two pills, two times a day. Okay, so those are some things I would think about. So maximize your curcumin up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day. Take your Eclonia Cava as two pills, two times a day, also known as Fiber Boost. And I would probably be on those at those doses for about two weeks then start to gradually decrease your biaxin. And the way I would decrease it first is to decrease it down to one half pill or, or to 250 milligrams twice a day. And I might do that for about a week. And if you seem to be tolerating that well, then go to 250 milligrams one time a day for a week. And if you're tolerating that well, then come off of it altogether, okay? All right, everyone, the Hutunia and Sitta Akuta are two herbs that I like to use to treat Bartonella. They work about 70% of the time. I do think prescription options work better. And um, I'll show you where you can see those prescription options in a minute. I have a whole article about that. Um, and then the Banderol Cemento are my two favorite herbs for managing Lyme disease. They kill Lyme. They work about 85 to 90% of the time. And they have the added benefit that they get rid of almost 100% of biofilm. Biofilm is a slime layer that can cover the Lyme germs. And according to Petri dish research that was done by um, Eva Choppy, that's S-A-P-I, Dr. Eva Choppy, um, she was able to show in Petri dish experiments that they get rid of 100% of biofilm. That's better than anything else does. That's better than stevia, which is a sweetener that you can sometimes use for biofilm. It only gets rid of about 45% of biofilm. And that's better than uh, the antibiotics. Antibiotics can reduce biofilms too. Um, tinidazole, which does the best and is the best antibiotic removal of biofilm, reduces them by 95%. Um, doxycycline reduces them by around 40 or 50%. Okay, so antibiotics will decrease um, biofilms too, but Banderol Cemento is your best option for that. All right, I'm gonna do a quick screen here. I wanna show you some resources here real quick. Let me go ahead and see if we can get that set up. All right, let's see here. All right, so I'm at the website treatlime.net, which is the treatline book. This is my online site where I have published resources about how to manage Lyme disease, okay? And um, the biggest part of this book is actually the treatline book where I have articles organized into chapters um, that can help you, okay? So I'm just gonna go up here. This is where you can see the chapters menu. And in the chapters menu is a chapter on infection treatment plans, okay? Right there, it's under this column called germ control and more, all right? So under the infection treatment plans, click on that. That'll pull up the chapter that has all the articles that I've written in it about how you kill various germs that you see in Lyme disease, okay? So one of the articles is an article called Kills Bartonella, A Brief Guide. And if you look in this article, you will see information about the Sitta Akuda and the Hutunia, but you will also see the information about the prescriptions that I recommend to treat Bartonella as well too. The prescriptions work about 85% of the time. The herbs work about 70% of the time, okay? There's also in this chapter um, uh, an article I have, a Lyme disease treatment guide, uh, a Lyme disease antibiotic guide, actually, that one, that's this article right here. 
this is where I lay out the ways that you can use antibiotics. And I, I'm going to be doing an update on that. I was supposed to have had it done by now, but probably in the next week, um, as I have returned from a conference I was at last week, probably this next week, you'll see me start focusing on updating this to include some information about what's called persister Lyme and something called Dapsone, which is a new uh, an antibiotic we are not starting to use to treat Lyme and something called persister Lyme, all right? All right, then the other thing I wanna show you on the Treat Lyme book is this tab called Treatment Protocol. And this is, <clears throat> brings up the Lyme disease treatment guidelines that I've written called the Successful Treatment Recipe. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but you should take a look at this later. There's multiple steps that I lay out that you should address in Lyme. And this includes things like getting sleep, and I give you recommendations about how to do it. But everything here are steps you should take to recover from Lyme. It is not just about poisoning your germs. You have to do things to support the body. And one of those is to lower cytokines, those inflammation chemicals that I was just telling you about. And this is where I talk about curcumin, okay? All right, let me go back here again. All right, so um, Deborah, thank you for that question and um, good luck to you. Let's see, I'm just removing Deborah's question from my side of the screen. All right, let me see. Hello, Julie. Let's see, Dr. Ross, I have developed edema on my feet. It's moving towards my legs, massive headaches. All tests for kidneys, liver, and blood count were fine. My heart rate is at 120 sometimes, and sometimes it's at 70 while at rest. Any idea what this can be? The doctor wants to do an ultrasound of my legs. Okay, so edema, everyone, means swelling of the tissues and it actually means holding water in the skin, okay? So one sign of having edema is swelling ankles and if you press on those ankles with your thumb or your finger, you can actually indent it. You can leave like a dent. You actually are pushing the water out of the way and it, it leaves a dent. Now, things that can lead to um, edema or water accumulation, this can occur if you have kidney problems and liver problems. So that's, um, I'm glad to see that your doctor checked that. It also can occur if you have anemia. Um, and the reason it can occur if you have anemia is the red blood cells inside your, your blood system, red blood cells attract water. They hold water in the blood vessels. And if you don't have enough red blood cells, that means the water will leak out into the tissues, okay? All right, now, it is possible that if you have blockage of your veins, veins bring water out of the legs, that you could develop edema. So I agree with what your doctor's doing in terms of checking the ultrasound. Another thing that can happen is there's something called the lymph system. You, you all know about lymph nodes. I mean, we got a bunch of lymph nodes up here. But we actually have lymph nodes throughout the rest of the body too. And those lymph nodes, which are part of the immune system, are connected by channels. Um, and those that, that is a system through which uh, white blood cells and lymph flow, but lymph, the lymph system also absorbs water. So sometimes if you have inflammation within your lymph system, that can lead to accumulation too. Now, there are certain providers that are trained in a technique called lymph drainage, where they can do therapy to the lymph system to actually massage it and work it to get better flow of liquid out, okay? Now, one other thing that could be leading to your edema can sometimes be in a side effect of the antibiotics. And in particular, the tetracyclines, doxycycline and minocycline um, can lead to water accumulation. And where water likes to go is, water is pulled to the lowest part of our bodies by gravity, okay? so you accumulate most of your liquid in the legs when you have this kind of edema that's due to the antibiotics, in particular, uh, the doxycycline and tetracycline, okay? So Julie, I agree with what your doctor's doing. One thing I would consider is look to see if you're on the, the tetracyclines. If you are, they may be leading you to retain water as well too. And beyond that, those are the ideas I have, okay? All right, good luck to you. And thank you for that question too. Let's see. Hello, Brenda. Let's see. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for the uh, for these webinars. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I have Lyme and Bartonella. What would you recommend to help me sleep? 
I have tried Ambien, Hydroxazine, Melatonin, and Benadryl. I have MTHFR and sensitive to many medications. Also, do you recommend digestive enzymes? Okay. So, Brenda, I have a whole article about uh, ideas for sleep, and there's a chapter on ideas for sleep uh, in the Treat Line book, okay? So you might want to take a look at that later, um, which will have many of these ideas, okay? So one thing you want to make sure that you do for sleep is to do the, um, how can I, I'll call it the behavioral health or lifestyle things that help sleep, okay? All right, so first of all, when you have Lyme disease, one of the reasons you don't sleep is that there are these increased cytokines that I described earlier that occur when you have Lyme. One of the things that they do is they, um, they negatively impact what we call the sleep centers of the brain. They make it so the sleep centers don't work, okay? So one thing you wanna make sure you're doing to help your sleep is to be on the curcumin that I mentioned earlier, 500 milligrams three times a day, okay? That's one thing I definitely would wind up doing. Second thing is make sure you stop all caffeine, all caffeine. That means soda pop caffeine, tea caffeine, coffee caffeine. Get that stuff out of your system. Stop it by around 12 o'clock in the day, all right? So what happens with caffeine is it, um, uh, it, it literally interferes with chemicals that build up during the day that can put you into sleep, okay? So you don't want to do that, all right? All right, third thing you wanna do is make sure that you get rid of any blue light at night, okay? So blue light is the same kind of light as we have in the morning. So, you know, first thing in the morning light is very stimulating, that's what gets us going. Our computer screens and our iPad screens and our cell phone screens all are blue light, all right? So you gotta get rid of that stuff. You either turn your keyboards off and your computers off, um, your e-readers off, um, by around six or seven at night, or you can get apps that will change the lighting on your screen so that it's more of a yellow light, okay? So for instance, um, your um, the iPhones, for instance, um, actually have in the control panel section, have a night light setting that changes it more so it's a yellow light. Um, you can get that on your iPads, I believe as well too. Um, you can get an app that will do it also on your computers and, you know, on your Apple computers or on your uh, Microsoft-based uh, computers as well, too, okay? All right, so you need to make sure you do that, okay? Next lifestyle thing that you need to make sure you do is do not do anything in your bed that is stimulating. So don't work in your bed, okay? Um, save your bed for sleep or for making love with your partner, but just save it for those activities. I wouldn't do any other activities in, in your bed, all right? Finally, make sure you're trying to initiate sleep the same time every night. You don't want to uh, change that around too much because if you do, that can alter your circadian rhythms in terms of how they work on sleep, okay? So those are just some key things. Be on curcumin, do those lifestyle things I was just talking about. All right, then, in terms of sleep, there are herbs you can use, and you have done one of them here, which is the melatonin. What I will tell you, if people have severe sleep problems, the herbs usually don't work. And where I usually like to go, I try Ambien like you've tried here, but if it doesn't work, another medication I like to try is something called Trazodone. Trazodone is actually a um, antidepressant medicine, but at low doses, it does put people, science shows that it does put people into restorative sleep, which is called REM3 and REM4 sleep. That stands for rapid eye movements. So when we get into deep sleep, you can actually see the eyes under the eyelids going a certain speed, and we call that REM, and there's different speeds. There's REM3 and REM4, and when you get into REM3 and REM4 sleep, that's restorative sleep, okay? Trazodone at 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams can get people into REM3 and REM4 sleep. The other advantage of trazodone, it can sometimes help with pain. It is an antidepressant medicine, but at these lower doses, it's really good for sleep, okay? Now, try it out and see if you can, if you can handle that. Another option is something called gabapentin, which is an anti-seizure medicine. That sometimes can help with sleep. Another option is to take something called Seroquel, which is actually an antipsychotic <laughs> that can help with sleep. Anyhow, there's a variety of prescription options, and I'm not going to list them all out here, but you can find them, and there's also herbal options you can find too. 
you can find them in my articles on sleep. And so I'm going to go ahead and show you that right now. I'm going to go over to the treat line book again. Okay, so I'm at the treat line book now. And to find the chapter on sleep, go up here to the chapters, go into this category called problem solved and look at the sleep chapter, okay? Now in the sleep chapter is where I talk about the sleep basics that I was just describing to you. And then there's an article on the prescription medicines of which Trazodone and Ambien are two of them, but I lay out many other ones here. And I talked to you about how to layer them too. And then there's an article I do have about the herbal options for sleep, okay? So take a look at this later. Yeah, you, you'll have to subscribe to read it, but um, that helps support the efforts that I do to maintain the book and to actually write new articles. So I appreciate if you do support the work that we're doing here, okay? The other thing I wanna say about sleep, when it comes to looking at um, the herbs that you use or um, the prescription medicines that you use, I like to think in terms of medicines that get you to sleep and medicines that keep you asleep, okay? So these cytokines that disturb the sleep centers in Lyme um, can impair your ability to get asleep, but also to stay asleep. So there are certain medicines you'll see when you start reading my articles that are better get you out medicines, get you to sleep medicines. And there are certain medicines that are better keeping you asleep medicines. Sometimes you need to mix a get you out medicine with a keep you out medicine, okay? And I lay that out in that article, in those three articles, okay? So take a look at those later. It gives you the information you need to get some sleep. Um, good luck to you, Brenda. Thank you for that question. All right, let's see here. Hello, Eric, let's see. I'm on Seftin and Biaxin with pulsing tonight is on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I feel like my fingers are hard to move and sometimes I see some redness on my finger joints. Do you know anything that can help with this? Is this Lyme arthritis or just weakness from Lyme? So Eric, I don't know from just this brief descri description, okay? So, but I will make a comment on both of those, all right? So, First of all, if you have Lyme involving your joints, you can sometimes get swelling of those joints that then goes into the fingers too. And if you get too much swelling in the skin, it's gonna make it hard to move things, okay? So yeah, one possibility is that you've got too much swelling. It's literally making it difficult to move things. On the other hand, it is possible that you your Lyme is affecting your nerves, making it so that they don't make the muscles work correctly. And so you may be having some inability to move because of that. Um, you, this is one of those situations where if you can't figure out if you have swelling, you may need to go to your doctor and just have them look at it so they can determine whether you have swelling, okay? Now, one thing I wanna let you know, uh, so, so first of all, if you do have swelling, make sure you're doing something about inflammation, okay? And my number one thing I like to use, as you know, is the curcumin. You might use up to 1,000 milligrams three times a day. Um, the other thing that you might want to add to that is the fiber boost that I talked about earlier today, okay? That's that brown seaweed is useful for getting the inflammation down, okay? And as you know, I've got a whole article about cytokines and inflammation. Um, I'll show you all where you can look at that later to get more ideas, all right? Um, one thing you should be aware of, if you decide, if your doctor and you decide this might be neuropathy, leading to weakness of your hand muscles, be aware that tinidazole can sometimes give neuropathy, okay, as a side effect. Um, and that's because uh, vitamin B, it interferes with vitamin B6 metabolism. And that can sometimes lead to neuropathy. So one thing you might want to look at, and I don't know because I can't ask you the question, is did you have this weakness before you began the tinidazole? And if you didn't, you may want to reconsider the tinidazole. Also, get on vitamin B6. Um, it comes usually as a 50 milligram or 100 milligram pill. Um, if you take 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams one time a day, that's usually going to be enough to take care of the weakness from a neuropathy uh, from the tinidazole. Okay. Um, yeah, so that those are some things that I would think about with that, Eric. Okay. I'm going to do a quick screen share here again, everyone.
All right, so I'm back in the treat line book again. I'm going to go ahead and look in the chapters, and I'm going to look at under the problem solve section. I'm going to go to Herxheimer and cytokines, and this actually I may want to just change this so it says inflammation. All right, but there the big article that you want to read that gives you the various things you can take to get inflammation down is this article called Control Cytokines. A Guide to Fix Lyme Symptoms and the Immune System, okay? So remember, uh, as I've said here tonight, and I've say, I say often, um, Lyme disease triggers cytokines. It is the cytokines that give you all your symptoms. In addition, those cytokines can suppress the immune system. So if you can lower cytokines, you can go a long ways towards getting immune suppression taken care of and also um, dealing with the symptoms that people have with Lyme disease too, okay? So take a look at that later. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and go and show you, I'm going to try to show something. Oh, there it is. Um, so this is the supplement store where my patients get their supplements. It's Marty Ross MD and Tara Brook ND supplements. Um, the reason I have a supplement store is so that my patients have options of getting some of the best supplements that are out there. Okay. And, and safe supplements. All right. So, um, I've chosen supplements for here that have, a, um, based on their brands, that, that I know do a good job of selecting for the most active ingredients, okay? A lot of lower cost supplements that are out there use ingredients that may not have the best activity, may not be the most effective. The other thing I've done in choosing supplements for this site is I've tried to choose supplements that have low chances of toxicity. And that is ones that don't use a lot of artificial fillers that can harm you, all right? So when I mention something you can try, if you're wanting to know what I use, you can find it here at my supplement store, which is at www.treatlime.com. My Lyme disease information site, the Treat Lyme book, is at treatlime.net, okay? So .net for the information site, .com for the supplements, okay? And so this supplement that I've talked about, the Eclonia Cava, you can find it as a product called FibroBoost. All right, there it is. That's the FibroBoost, okay? So Aclonia Cava, I want to do a couple pills twice a day on that, okay? All right, let me go back here again. All right, thank you, Eric, and, um, and good luck to you. Let's see here. Hello, Janet. Let's see, do you have any advice about treatment for Lyme patients with frozen shoulder? You know, um, you know, I don't have specific ideas for a Lyme patient because um, so frozen shoulder, everyone, means that literally there's um, scarring of tissue around the shoulder joint that makes it so you can't move it. Okay. And sometimes it can also be due to weakness of the muscles in that area as well, too. So Janet, in terms of, of Lyme's relationship to that, Lyme and inflammation can lead to scarring and inflammation, making it so things don't work. Also Lyme and some of the co-infections can make it so the nerves that are supposed to make these muscles work don't work correctly. So, you know, follow the, the successful treatment recipe that I have, my Lyme disease treatment guidelines to deal with treating Lyme and Bartonella, for instance, okay? But in addition, there are some other things you may want to think about that can be helpful for frozen shoulder. One is physical therapy. Another thing actually that can do really remarkably well is acupuncture. Acupuncture can be marvelous for this uh, kind of a condition. And those are two things I would think about, okay? Make sure physical therapy and consider doing acupuncture as well too, okay? All right. Good luck, Janet. Hello, Lori. Let's see. Thanks for the great webinar. You're welcome. Let's see. I'm wondering why I have such darkness under my eyes. This comes and goes a lot and is accompanied with significantly increased fatigue. I never feel good. Any ideas what might be the cause of this darkness? Thanks so much. You know, it's interesting, Lori. I, I don't know. I, I actually don't know other than you do see the dark circles on the eyes when people get fatigued. And so my way of treating it is to deal with the fatigue, which is get Lyme under control, and deal with 
other things that can lead to fatigue. Okay, so one other thing that can lead to fatigue is having adrenal fatigue, having low thyroid. Those are causes of fatigue. Okay, another thing is having mitochondria fatigue. Okay, or mitochondria dysfunction. So you might want to correct for all those. All right. So in terms of your adrenals, signs that your adrenals can be having a hard time include afternoon crashing. Uh, which means like a big decline in your energy in the afternoon. Other signs of adrenal fatigue um, uh, can be um, uh, having uh, hypoglycemia, so meaning you need to eat frequently to avoid getting jittery or shaky. That can be a sign of low adrenals. Um, getting lightheaded often as you stand up can be a sign of low adrenals, all right? So if you have enough symptoms to suggest low adrenals, I like using the, the herb a Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine herb called ashwagandha. You'll see that in the successful treatment recipe. It's a 400 milligram pill, two pills in the morning, two pills between one and two. If you have significant symptoms of low thyroid, make sure you correct that, okay? And so symptoms of low thyroid include a cold intolerance, hair falling out, a muscle achiness. Those are things that can suggest low thyroid and you should treat for low thyroid too, all right? And then finally, um, if you've been treated for your Lyme for about six months to nine months and your energy is not improving, start thinking about mitochondria dysfunction. Okay, so what mitochondria are, every one of our cells has a power plant system. They're called mitochondria. And by some estimates, there's 300 to 400 mitochondria in a cell. Mitochondria have a fat membrane and that fat membrane um, can get injured in Lyme. And the reason it gets injured is um, as a result of having all these germs in us, our immune system overproduces uh, uh, oxidizing agents, okay? Oxidizing agents damage fat membranes and they can damage the covering of the mitochondria. If that mitochondria membrane gets damaged, the chemical reactions that take place on the inside don't occur correctly. And a big reason is, is that healthy covering needs to donate electrons into a number of the chemical reactions. And if it's injured, you don't get that electron donation. Therefore, you don't get adequate energy generation, all right? The other thing that can happen is if that fat membrane gets damaged, it doesn't allow for good uptake of sugar and fat to the inside of the mitochondria to be burned into cell fuel, all right? So you can repair that. Um, and I, I have an article about how do you do mitochondria repair, okay? So, Lori, take a look at the articles I have on correcting hormone dysfunction and also on mitochondria dysfunction to help with some of this energy you're having, okay? But in terms of the um, color under the eye, I don't know why you get that coloration change other than there's something we see in fatigue. Uh, let me do a quick screen share here so you can see where you can find the articles that explain in more detail uh, about what to take for your adrenals and your thyroid and also what to do for the mitochondria dysfunction. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. Okay, so I'm going to go back into the treat line book here. So I'm back in the treat line book. I go up here to the chapter section and I'm going to look under the problem solve section under the chapter called energy and fatigue. Okay, so here's the article on mitochondria. And I talk about the various things you can do to improve your mitochondria function. I also talk here, there's an article on the best diet you can do. It's a, it tends to be a paleo type diet, but I give you a lot of tools to implement that diet here in the best brain inflammation, pain, energy, and detox diet ever, okay? Uh, there's an article called Fix Fatigue, Boost Your Energy, The Basic Steps. And in here, I do talk about thyroid and adrenal repair and also getting sleep, okay? And then finally, there should be an article down here, Heat Up, Speed Up, about the thyroid and adrenals, and also about ashwagandha. And I was just talking to you about ashwagandha, okay? So take a look at these articles in the Treat Line book for a lot more detail um, about this situation than what I just described. All right, let me go back here. Hmm. There we are. All right. Thanks, Lori, for that question. Good luck to you. All right. 
Hello, Kim. Let's see. Wasn't there a webinar last week? I couldn't get on and got no recording the next day. No, there wasn't. Um, I had one originally scheduled, but I had forgotten to plan for the fact that I was at a um, um, at a medical conference last week in the middle, uh, towards the end of the week. So I wasn't able to be here last week. So no, there wasn't one, Kim. Uh, and to make up for that, I'm having one today, and then there'll be another one in the next two weeks. So there's going to be three in a row now. Okay. All right. All right. Hello, Lori. Let's see. Is an increase in muscle aches and joint pain usually Bartonella? Interesting. Um, so Bartonella sometimes does give increased joint pain. I usually don't think of it as giving increased muscle pain. I usually think of that as being more of a Lyme type symptom. Okay. But Lyme can also give increased joint pains too. If you're trying to figure out if Bartonella is active, see if you have some increases in the following symptoms, okay? So decreased thinking, which can sometimes be Lyme, but decreased thinking, um, increased joint pain sometimes, increasing anxiety or depression, increased day sweats, uh, increasing restless legs, which is a feeling like things are crawling on your legs, so you got to move them around. Um, increased bladder problems like uh, burning on urination or an urge to pee frequently. That can sometimes indicate um, having uh, Bartonella. Um, increased neurologic sensitivities like um, sound sensitivity or light sensitivity. Those are things that might make you think about Bartonella being active, okay? But joint pain could be part of that. Sometimes can be more part of Lyme actually, okay? All right. Uh, good luck to you, Laurie. Hello, Sue. Let's see. Do you recommend doing stevia while on Cemento and Banderol? Thank you for all you do, Sue. Um, you're welcome, Sue. No, I don't. And, and here's why. So um, Sue raises an interesting question. Many of you may know I, I posted an article a couple weeks ago about stevia. Um, Eva Choppy, who I mentioned earlier tonight, is the person that's done a lot of research on Banderol Cemento. She also has done some work looking at ways to treat what is known as persister Lyme. Um, which is Lyme, um, well, actually, I, I'll talk more about persister Lyme in a minute, but in looking at treatment for persister Lyme, she's discovered that stevia, the, uh, which is a plant that has a sweet taste to it, that stevia um, may be able to break down biofilm and may help with persister Lyme. I think, though, that the Banderol Cemento does a better job breaking down biofilm uh, so everyone, biofilm is a slime layer that can cover Lyme germs. You know, Choppy's work on stevia shows that it gets rid of about 45% of biofilm. While if you look at the work she did on Banderol Cemento, it shows on Petri dish experiments that that gets rid of 100% biofilm. So I don't think there's any added advantage. I have not found stevia to augment a Banderol Cemento treatment either. So I don't think you necessarily need to add it. I, I don't think there's any added benefit in doing that. Okay. All right. So what's persister Lyme? Well, so there's uh, been some, we know from the world of tuberculosis and we know from the world of leprosy, for instance, that there is this thing called a persister cell. And what a persister cell is, is a type of cell of that kind of a germ that basically starts becoming antibiotic tolerant, not resistant, but tolerant, meaning the antibiotic just stops working on it. And if you can get the, and so what we think a persister cell is, is it a germ that's kind of gone into hibernation. It stops growing. And in, in a hibernation state, it doesn't respond to the antibiotics anymore. But if you can get it growing again, it will start responding to the antibiotic. And that's why it's not resistant to the antibiotic. It's tolerant. It just needs to get growing to respond to that antibiotic again, okay? Now, it's been shown then in Lyme that around, according to some Petri dish and test tube experiments, in some of these experiments in the laboratory, not in humans, but in laboratory, it's been shown that when you expose these germs to antibiotics for a while, about 20% may turn into persister cells. And so some people are hypothesizing that it's these persister cells that make it so people don't get over Lyme, okay? 
And that's, again, that's based on these petri dish experiments. Now, on these petri dish and test tube experiments, one way of getting rid of, of persister Lyme is to do pulsing of antibiotics. And in, the, in these test tube and test tube and petri dish experiments, it's been shown that if you can start and stop antibiotics about four times, you can get rid of these germs altogether. Now, the problem is we don't know if that holds true in living people, all right? This is petri dish experiments. But what they've been able to show on some of these petri dish experiments, test tube experiments, is that if you stop the antibiotics for about 24 hours and wash the antibiotics off of the germs, after about 24 hours, the germ goes back into a growth phase and starts responding to the antibiotics again. The problem is we don't know how long it takes a lot of these antibiotics to clear out of a human in terms of how long we would need to stop in terms of pulsing the antibiotics, okay? So many of you may know there's a number of my colleagues that advocate pulsing antibiotics. I do so sometimes with my patients. I actually find pulsing works maybe as well as actually continuous use antibiotics, okay? But I do know that with this idea of persister cells, maybe it does make sense to go ahead and pulse antibiotics. The frequency that I've been choosing to do pulsing at is to do four days of antibiotics and three days off. And the reason I take the three days off is I want to make darn sure that I've had that person off that antibiotic long enough that that germ gets back into a growth phase. The Petri dish experiments tell us maybe 24 hours is enough. I want to wait a little bit longer, all right? We have no inhuman experiments, though, that tell us what is the ideal frequency. Uh, one of the researchers that had done this persister cell experiments um, um, out of Northeastern University has, is in the process of getting some animal experiments going to look at this, okay? Nor do we know the best antibiotics to do the, the pulsing antibiotics. So I know a number of my colleagues are out pulsing antibiotics. I do, and everyone's got different regimens about how to pulse. There is truly no ideal regimen that has been shown to be effective because that research has not been done. Right? We don't know what's the best frequency to pulse for persister cells. In addition, I will tell you, I get people well without pulsing antibiotics. So it's not clear if persister cells actually happen in everybody that has Lyme. But you will see um, coming up that I will be writing an article kind of describing what I was have been talking about here with persister cells. Okay, So stevia may help with persister cells. That's what um, Eva Choppy showed in her recent research. Uh, but in looking at how... I find cemento and banderol to work, I question if they might also be beneficial for these persister cells as well, because I use them when treatment gets blocked and it seems to move treatment forward. Um, you'll see, again, I, I had hoped to have that article, a couple articles about this done here by now, but probably over the next week, I'll be able to devote some attention to getting those done. Okay. All right. So anyhow, I hope that answers your questions there, Sue, uh, and gave you more information to think about too. Let's see here. Oh, I'm going to do a quick screen share just so for many of you may know, because I did send out an email to our email subscriber list about the stevia. But let me just show you in case you did miss that article. All right. So I'm back in the treat line book. Uh, let's do a search for that stevia article here. All right, there it is, stevia for Lyme disease. Okay, I also mentioned stevia in the biofilms uh, chapter as well too. All right, so take a look here. I, I do talk in more depth than I just did about uh, Eva Choppy's research and why you might want to consider stevia and even how to use it as well too. All right. All right, let's go back here again. All right, hello, Pamela. I just made it. <laughs> you probably have been here for a while because we're already about uh, 50 minutes into this webinar, but um, thank you for <laughs> letting us know that. Let's see, can you explain a Lyme tonic seizure and what causes it? Also, how to treat diminish this? Many thanks for all you do to help the Lymeys out here. You're welcome, Pamela. So I'm not sure what you mean by ton Lyme tonic 
seizure, but let me try to talk about seizures in general, all right? So there is a type of seizure uh, which is called a tonic-clonic seizure, which means basically people pull their arms in and then they flail them out, their legs will kick. That's called a tonic-clonic seizure, and I suspect that's maybe what you mean by that, okay? Now, I will tell you, people with Lyme can have seizures. You actually can see somebody shake. You can see their arms move, their legs jerk. But when you go ahead and do the standard neurology testing to see if they have seizures, which is a test called an EEG, they basically hook a bunch of wires up to your head and try to measure the electrical activity. In my experience, most of the time that people have Lyme seizures, it never shows up on an EEG. And so the neurologist will tell people you don't have seizures and they'll say it's all in your head, for instance, okay? What I wanna let you know is they're wrong. Um, you can have seizures in Lyme that just for some reason do not register on EEGs. When somebody has seizures, there's two things I think of. One is they have active Lyme. And the other thing I wonder about is do they have Bartonella? Because Bartonella can give you some of these more extreme neurologic conditions, okay? so. In terms of helping with seizures, if you have something that looks like seizures, make sure Bartonella is being treated or has been treated. Make sure your Lyme is being treated, okay? Now, in terms of what you can do for those seizures to calm them down, you could try the herb called L-theanine. Um, L-theanine is a component of green tea. It's not caffeine, um, but it's converted in the brain into a chemical called GABA. And GABA helps calm agitation, okay? So L-theanine comes as a 100 milligram pill. You can do anywhere from 200 milligrams to 1200 milligrams a day. I won't go over 1200 milligrams though. And going up above that, can some, and there is an increased cancer risk if you actually get above 1200 milligrams in a day. But I would do it as a 100 milligram pill and you wanna divide, divide that, um, your total dose up into three or four times a day. So you can do like 300 milligrams three times a day, 400 milligrams three times a day, um, for instance, okay? You don't wanna go over four pills three times a day or 400 milligrams three times a day though, because that's 1200 milligrams, okay? That's one option. Um, make sure you're decreasing inflammation of your nerves too. So you need to make sure you're taking the curcumin, as I mentioned earlier, 500 milligrams three times a day, all right? Another thing to think about that can trigger um, um, seizures in somebody with Lyme is if they have the buildup of Lyme toxins or mold toxins. So you might wanna take a look at the article I've written about that called Lyme and Mold Toxins, a Lyme Bite. I'll show you that here in a minute for ideas about how you might deal with that as well too, okay? So let me go ahead and show you those resources so you can take a look at that later. All right, so I'm gonna go over here to the Lyme book again. All right, so in the, there's, a, there's a few things you wanna look at. Um, so first of all, take a look at the chapter called Brain and Nerves. And let me see. Take a look at this article called Tremor Treatment, a Lyme Bite, okay? The things you do for tremors are the same things that you would wind up doing for um, seizures, okay? All right, the other thing that you wanna take a look at is the article in the, the detox chapter, which is called Lyme and Mold Toxins, a Lyme Bite, okay? Take a look at this. I talk about Lyme toxins and mold toxins building up 25% of people do not have the ability to remove Lyme or mold toxins once they get in you. I talk about that in this article. And if you happen to be one of those people, those toxins could really be triggering a lot of the tremors and seizure activity as well too. I talk about how to get them out here in this article as well, okay? All right, let me go back here. All right, good luck to you, Pamela. And thank you for that question too. Hello, Jenny, let's see. What do you think of the Beyond Balance line of products? My LLMD stopped all my prescription now by after 10 months. I'm currently taking MCBB29 uh, nine drops twice a day. You know, 
I've looked at the Beyond Balance before, and I, I, I have tried them in the past too. I don't personally find them to be that helpful. They are more directed at immune support than necessarily being active germ killers. So in, in general, I'm, I don't have a good feeling about them or do I see them to work that well? Okay, that's just been what my experience has been, okay? All right, good luck to you, Jenny. Thank you for that question. Hello, Sarah. Hold on here, man, I gotta get a sip of water. All right, let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Recently tested positive through IGENIX. Doctor ran some other tests to confirm diagnosis. C4A is over 21,000. She tested natural killer cells. My level is two, but didn't run a CD57. Are CD57 and NK cells the same? Appreciate your thoughts. Thanks for all you do. So no, they're not the same. So um, there are natural killer cells and then there is a specific type of natural killer cell called a CD57. So it's a subset of the natural killer cells, all right? So in terms of testing for Lyme, one of the best tests that we can do still to this day, the best test to do for Lyme is to do a Western blot through IGENIX. A Western blot through IGENIX is a method to see has your immune system created antibodies that attach to proteins found on the covering of the Lyme germ. That test will find Lyme if you have it about 80 to 85% of the time. It still is the best test we have, okay? It measures your immune system reaction, okay? There's also another <coughs> test out there that many of you may be aware of, which is a Lyme disease blood culture test. It is expensive, it runs about $600, and there's only been limited testing showing that it might work. Uh, and that limited testing, I think, involved about 47 people. I will tell you, we never base anything in medicine based on studies of 47 people. But that study that was done showed that it will find Lyme if you have it about 95% of the time. But the trouble is, is that we do know that Lyme is hard to find in the blood. And so if you're doing a blood culture, it would make sense that it's also going to have a low success rate at finding Lyme. So even though the one study showed it finds Lyme 95% of the time, I think in the real world, it does not work that well. And I still think to this day, our best test for testing for Lyme is to do the Western blot, okay? Now, many of you may also know of another test called an I-spot or an Ella-spot test. Um, that test is run by a lab called Armin Labs that they do an Ella-spot test out of Germany, all right? Or some of you may have had a, a lab done by Pharmacin Labs called iSpot. Now the iSpot is measuring whether you have a reaction of a type of white blood cell called a T cell. Your own T cells, when they're exposed to Lyme, do they react? Do they show that you've been exposed to Lyme? And that test, and some experiments done looking at that show that maybe it will find Lyme about 90, 95% of the time. But that the studies done in that were only done at about 120 people. Again, not enough. And in addition, um, there were some major problem designs. And so in the real world, I don't think that the eye spot actually works that successful either, okay? So I know you can find experiments that say these other tests work better, but in practical experience, in using it in the real world, I still think the Western blot is the best test that's out there, all right? Now, if you wanna see more about these statistics that I'm talking about and my arguments why these other tests may not be as good, there is a whole uh, article I have about Lyme tests, and it's actually, I give, I grade the various Lyme tests, okay? I'll show that to you in a minute so you can look at it later, all right? Now, in terms of indirect tests, tests that are more indirect measurements of whether you have Lyme, that would be the CD57, and that's the C4A test, okay? So these tests measure reactions that we might see in your body or in your immune system um, that are kind of indirect because there may be other things that also cause these reactions, okay? So a low CD57 is a type of white blood cell that can be seen about 80% of the time in Lyme. You can see that it's low about 80% of the time, but we also know HIV causes it to be low. And it's very possible that chronic virus infections may cause it to be low. So the fact that when it comes back low, doesn't prove it's Lyme causing it to be low. So therefore, I don't like using it, okay? 
The other thing, the C4A is a test called complement 4A. Um, complements are a protein system that the immune system uses to fight infections. It will be elevated if you have active Lyme, but it can also be elevated if you have toxicity issues, mold toxicity issues, and Lyme toxicity issues. So the fact that it's elevated does not prove Lyme is active, okay? Versus if you have antibodies in a Western blot elevated, that's coming from Lyme, okay? And your eye spot test, if it comes back positive, that's coming from Lyme, all right? So that's why I prefer those tests over doing a C4A and a CD57, all right? All right, so let me go over here. I'm gonna do a quick screen share. And I'm going to show you where you can find my article on testing. Okay, so you look in chapters. Um, take a look at the Lyme Disease 101 column here, all right, and under test. And in here, I have various articles about Lyme testing, but the one you want to read is this one called a Review of Lyme Infection Test, Pass or Fail. I literally grade them, okay? Um, the other thing I would just point out, I'm often asked, is there a good test you can do in the middle of treatment to see where you are? I know a number of my colleagues, for instance, will repeat Western blots and they'll do C4As and they'll do all kinds of things. The reality is there is not a good test to see where you are. I just want to point that out. I have a whole article about it here as well too, okay? All right, let me go back here. All right, Sarah, thank you for that question. Good luck to you. Hello, Randy. Let's see, I'm having surgery in five days. I'm taking banderol cemento and lots of supplements. Do I need to stop taking everything? What should I take after surgery to help my immune system? So what I will let you know is there aren't decent studies about the effects of anesthesia with most supplements. And therefore, I suggest people stop your supplements about five days before surgery. I'd probably go ahead and stop them now. That way you take away the risk of any adverse interactions and also risk of uh, poor blood clotting, okay? You can restart things about 48 hours after surgery because by that time, most blood clotting that needs to take place has taken place and you're not going to interfere with the healing process at that point, all right? Um, in terms of boosting the immune system, you know, the things I would do is get your Lyme treatment going, all right? So, and also lower your cytokines, okay? Getting cytokines down, beginning your curcumin again, 48 hours after surgery is a great way of boosting the immune system, okay? Those are just some thoughts that I have, Randy. All right, good luck to you. Good luck with that surgery too. Hello, Kate. Let's see. I've had all the typical Lyme symptoms as well as one I still can't figure out. My ears have been chronically full and popping for 18 months. Is this Lyme related or could it be missing another piece of the puzzle? So ears popping usually mean, Kate, that you have something called eustachian tube dysfunction. All right. So you know you have the tube here, this, this outer tube is the tube that goes down to the eardrum, all right? And then behind the, the eardrum is another tube that actually goes from the back of the eardrum and comes out at your tonsils on the inside of your mouth. Come, there's a, 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 an exit point at the base of the tonsils. And what the eustachian tube is supposed to do is supposed to stay open to keep air pressure equal on both sides of your eardrum. Okay, that's what it's supposed to do. Now, if the skin that lines the eustachian tube swells, it sometimes will swell up and block the opening of the eustachian tube, which gives that then leads to an accumulation of mucus, and you can get this kind of popping, and it won't stay open all the time, all right? That sounds like what you have going on. Now, I usually don't think of Lyme or any of the infections giving eustachian tube dysfunction. I don't see that happen. That doesn't mean they're not doing it, but I usually don't see that happen. One of the things though that can give you station tube dysfunction uh, because it can lead to um, allergic type reactions that leads to the skin swelling that is in the eustachian tube. Remember I said it will swell and block the opening, okay? 
is if you happen to get too many yeast in your intestines. And how does that relate to Lyme? Well, if you have Lyme and you're being treated, you're on antibiotics. And if you're on antibiotics, that can potentially lead to more yeast in your intestines. Or if you haven't been on antibiotics yet, Lyme suppresses the immune system in a way that makes it easier for yeast to grow in the intestines. When you have too many yeast in the intestines, that can sometimes, those yeast can trigger allergic reaction in the intestines to the yeast. And then the intestines release um, histamines or the, uh, the immune cells around the intestines release histamines into the bloodstream that then go up to the ears that then trigger allergic type reactions in the ears, okay? Where you get swelling of those cells and you get mucus production that blocks the, the opening of these tubes. So one thing that you might wanna look at is seeing if you have too many yeast. And one way you can do that, there's a whole article I have in the treat line book, I'll show you here in a minute. That's about how do you diagnose yeast? How do you figure out if you have too many yeast, okay? So let me go there. Let me go ahead and do a screen share. All right, so I'm back in the treat line book here. In the treat line book, look in chapters and take a look at the chapter on yeast. And there's a article here called A Silent Problem. Do you have yeast? Okay, take a look at this. I talked to you about ways you can figure out if you might have too many yeast. Okay. All right, let's go back here again. All right, Kate. Um, good luck to you helping figure that out, okay? Oh, you actually, with eustachian tube dysfunction too, Kate, sometimes it can be seen when you do an ear exam, when your doctor does an ear exam. So they might want to look in there and see if you've developed any uh, fluid behind the eardrum that could indicate that that's going on. All right, let's see, is biaxin and rifabutin a powerful comb combination to fight Bartonella? Yeah. So again, I have a whole article, Bob, that you could look at other options. Uh, the article is called Kills Bartonella Brief Guide. You'll find it in the infection treatment plans chapter in the treat line book. Um, but one of the, what I recommend, this, the strongest treatments to treat Bartonella usually are a two prescription antibiotic combination, and they can work about 80 to 85% of the time. And I list a number of those that could work, of which Biaxin and Rifabutin is a potential. Okay, Rifabutin, everyone is Rifamp, and you'll see me write about that. So it's a combination that can work. It, it works about 80, 85% of the time, okay? If you're looking for other ideas, Take a look at the in the infection treatment plan chapter in the treat line book, where you'll see an article called Kills Bartonella, a brief guide. Take a look there. I give you a lot of other options in there as well, too. Okay? All right, Bob. Good luck to you. Hello, De hi Debbie. I assume I think I know who Debbie H is, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think you're I think you're one of my um, in, in the in the in, within the practice of the Healing Arts Partnership. So, and if that's so, Debbie, I hope your daughter's doing okay as well too. Hi, Marty. How long would one have um, to try lumber kinase to appreciate a benefit about pain relief? Thank you. So, lumber kinase, everyone, is uh, a group of enzymes that are um, uh, come from the skin of earthworms, actually. It's a crazy illness, the things we have to do. Yes, we use earthworms, all right? So lumber kinase has uh, two potential benefits in this, in this um, disorder. Number one, it breaks down proteins uh, that are found in biofilm, right? So biofilm that I mentioned earlier tonight is a layer of slime that can cover Lyme germs and it can block out the immune system, can block out your antibiotics too. It's uh, the slime has actually got two major components. One is a sugar slime, and the second component is a protein skeleton that holds that slime together. That protein skeleton is made up of fibrin, which is a blood clotting protein. Lumber kinase breaks down fibrin, and so it can be used to break down biofilm. Sorry. Right? The other thing uh, that lumber kinase does is it can be used to treat what I call sticky blood. 
or sticky blood also would be known as hypercoagulable or more easily clotting blood, all right? So one of the things that can happen when you have chronic infection is chronic infection um, can lead to an increased production of fibrin in the immune system, all right? Remember I said fibrin is part of, uh, of biofilms, but fibrin is made to form blood clots, but the immune system will also make more if there's chronic inflammation, all right? It just does. Now that increased fibrin gets into your bloodstream and it kind of thickens it up. It makes it sticky. It doesn't flow as well into smaller blood vessels. And so therefore it may not flow as well deep into your muscles. And if your muscles don't get adequate blood flow, they become starved for oxygen and it can lead to achiness, all right? So you can use lumbar kinase to break that fibrin down to increase blood flow to your tissues and so you don't have as much muscle achiness. And I think that's what Debbie's doing here. If you're gonna do that, it's lumbar kinase, 20 milligrams, one pill twice a day. You have to avoid taking other things with your lumbar kinase by one hour either side, okay? And the reason you need to do that is it's an enzyme. It'll digest those other things in the stomach with it and not get absorbed and therefore will not be helpful at treating sticky blood or getting rid of your biofilm. So I think Debbie and 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 I, her daughter, I believe, if this is the Debbie H I'm thinking of, uh, may be using a lumbar kinase to help with muscle pain or myalgia. Um, so Debbie, usually I'll find within about two months it's going to have its impact. If you haven't seen any benefit in uh, muscle achiness and using it for two months, then it may be time to stop taking it. Okay, all right. Good luck to you, and um, and 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 good luck to your daughter as well too. All right, let's see what's next here. Hello, Nina. Okay, let's see here. I stopped antibiotics for Lyme and BART in December to treat heavy metals. Took one month off from DMSA and supplements, but symptoms increased 25% mental fatigue, brain fog, anxiety, ringing ears, balance off, tremors in hand. Is it return of Lyme or heavy metals or question mark? I'm on the Mito diet, 95%, so doubt it's yeast. Should I let my body recharge before adding DMSA? What are your thoughts? Ah, okay, so um, Nina is wondering why she's gotten worse here, okay? So one option, Nina, yes, could be yeast, even though you're on the Mito food plan. And everyone, the Mito food plan is a diet. If you look in my food and nutrition chapter, you're going to see that the diet I recommend is this thing called the Mito food plan, all right? It's a paleo type diet, low in carbohydrates, high in fat. It's great for nerve cell function. It's great for mitochondria function. I mentioned the mitochondria earlier tonight is your power factories. You want to support them. This is the diet I recommend for people to take, okay? And I think what Nina is trying to tell me is that since she's been on that diet, she has low chances of feeding her yeast. Therefore, her decline is not due to yeast, okay? So everyone, when you get a decline in Lyme after you've been doing better, about 80 to 90% of the time, it's actually due to too many yeast growing in your intestines. And the relationship is, as many of you know, I described that Lyme symptoms are actually too many cytokine symptoms, all right? So cytokines our inflammation chemicals made by white blood cells when they see Lyme, cytokines give you what we call Lyme symptoms, all right? Now, it's possible if you start doing worse, it's not coming from Lyme triggering cytokines. It can be from something else triggering cytokines. And that something else can be yeast and they can look identical, all right? So Nina, even though you're not feeding your yeast, it's still possible you could have too many yeast. So make sure you're not having increased sugar cravings, that you're not having uh, in, any increase in intestinal gassiness or bloating, that you're not having difficulties uh, with um, vaginal itching or vaginal discharge. If you're a woman, you're a woman, but I'm talking to other people here too, um, that you're not um, having difficulty swallowing. Sometimes if you get too many yeast, it actually builds up in your food pipe and it can feel like things are catching. Another sign that you might have too many yeast in the intestines is if you start having acne or skin rashes, they will get worse if you have too many yeast in the intestines, okay? So Nina, if, if you have none of that, if you have stuff that there's a really low possibility of yeast, 
then the next thing I would think of with this kind of picture from what you've just briefly described here is that unfortunately your Lyme has gotten active again. And I would probably advocate getting back on Lyme treatment, okay? Um, yeah, those are those are my thoughts. The you know getting back on DMSA, I don't think is necessary, which is something we use everyone for heavy metal chelation. I don't think is going to hurt what is going on with you at this point. Okay, but Nina, if you, I, I'd be glad to even give you a deeper consideration of what's happening here, if you just um, set up through uh, set up um, a time to visit with me, I, I do believe I, without seeing your last name here, I can't tell for sure. And I don't think I'm violating any confidentiality. But if you're the Nina that I think you are, that's part of my practice, I would say go ahead and set up an appointment time so we can look at this together. If you're not the Nina that's part of my practice, one thing you could do is set up an online visit with me too um, using my online consult service, okay? So I'm going to just do a quick screen share to show you that here real quick. Okay, so I'm often asked what my opinion is on things. Okay, my, the best way to give me your, give you my opinion is to actually ask you a lot of detailed questions so I have a better understanding. And I do that through this thing called, um, you know, find under the online consult on my one-to-one -one medical consult service, okay? Now, read through this entire page about how this works, okay? So that means reading down here about how it works and the disclaimer form that we have, okay? But um, anyhow, the bottom line is I can give you advice. I can, I do write a whole medical visit note uh, that you can that you can follow and that you can share with your provider. The only thing is about when I do this one-to-one -one consult is I'm not able to prescribe or order test unless you have been out here at least one time where I can examine you, okay? Um, my medical board will not allow me to prescribe for somebody that I have not actually visited with. But for those of you that are looking for what my input might be that you can even take back to your physician or for ideas about how you might make some changes in your treatment on your own using herbs or supplements, it's a wonderful way to get my opinion. So you might wanna take a look at that later, okay? All right, Nina, good luck to you. And if, if I'd be glad to reconsider this with you directly, okay? All right, bye-bye. All right, let me just remove that. So Karen asks, can we view this Q&A again later? Yes, um, tomorrow morning, uh, usually by around 6.30 in the morning, you'll get an email from me, Karen, um, that will include details about how you find the recorded version of this, okay? So yep, it'll be published tomorrow morning. Um, if you don't happen to get that email, if you take a look at the Treat Lime site under the webinars tab um, or the, the, treat, um, the treat Lime book site, uh, under the webinars, you'll see that there by there is a, a link to the recorded versions of the webinars. Okay, all right. Good luck to you. Let's see. Hello, RJ. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I have neural Lyme for a year and a half. My brain fog is crazy. I'm on rifampin, aminocycline, Sita Acuta, and Hotunia for four weeks, and I also take curcumin and 15 other supplements. It seems the brain fog and Lyme will not subside. My LLMD, let me see if I can follow the rest of your question here. Rats. RJ, the rest of your question didn't come through, but I'll try to just make a few comments here based on that, okay? So um, brain fog, everyone, can mean a couple of things. It can mean I have a hard time thinking, I have a hard time with memory, I have a hard time processing information, okay? So it means you can have a hard time with brain function. The other thing brain fog sometimes means is when they use, people use that word is they mean they have a cloudy or foggy feeling around their head, okay? To lower that foggy or cloudy feeling, take the curcumin, if you're, I think, I'm, yeah, you are taking curcumin. Curcumin lowers one of the chemicals that gives you that foggy feeling. And that's a chemical made by immune cells in the brain called quinolinic acid. Curcumin is good at lowering that. 500 milligrams three times a day, okay? Now, the other thing to make sure of, if you have brain fog and it's not lifting, another thing that can trigger that cloudy, foggy feeling is too many yeast in the intestines. 
So I know I've talked tonight about, I've showed you where you can look at articles about how to figure out if you might have too many yeast. Take a look at those articles, see if you have too many yeast, okay? Because that sometimes can create some of this problem too. Um, and yes, treat Bartonella. Bartonella can do this. Treat lime. Lime can do this too. Um, also consider uh, being on glutathione. Um, there's a whole article I have about glutathione in the Treat Lime book. You'll find it in the detox chapter. But uh, glutathione is very useful about clearing toxins out of the brain that may be interfering with your brain function um, as well too. And then finally, take a look. Um, there's a whole article I have written about thinking, all right? And let me show you that because it's full of good ideas, including glutathione, including using curcumin. Um, and But what the article is called is, well, let's see what it's called. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to look in the chapter on brain and nerves. And there's an article that I've written called, My Brain Isn't Working, I Think, What Can I Do? And in here, I talk about the various supplement approaches in addition to treating Lyme and Bartonella and yeast that you may want to consider doing, okay? But the two things I definitely would look at is glutathione, and I definitely would look at using the curcumin as well, too. All right, let me go back here. Okay, good luck to you, RJ. Let's see. Hello, Bob. I have severe Bartonella anxiety that only lorazepam takes the edge off of. Any other supplements or ways I can reduce? Uh, Bob, I'm sorry to hear that. Anxiety can just, it's, it can be one of the more aggravating symptoms that people have. Uh, but um, in terms of anxiety, when we think of managing anxiety, with prescription medicines, and I'll talk about herbs here in a minute. We th I think of, of breaking my anxiety medicines into two categories. There's the ones that control it, kind of keep a lid on it, and then there's the ones that break it quickly, all right? Lorazepam is in the Valium Thalamium medicines. It's a breaker. It's, it's something you would take to kind of stop it as it's happening, okay? But another thing you can add to that is to take um, certain antidepressant medicines uh, that are in the same family as Prozac, for instance, or ones that are in the are called tricyclic antidepressant medicines, like that trazodone I talked about earlier tonight. So, in the Prozac family, one called Celexa can work really well. Paxil can work well. Zoloft can work well. Lexapro can work well. They do a good job of, of putting a lid on the anxiety. Once you start them, though, you're going to have to give them about a week or two weeks of being on them before they will help put a lid on it. Okay and then you use your lorazepam to break it. If you wanna look at ways that you can treat your anxiety herbally, that would help kind of put control on it, you might look at L-theanine. I mentioned L-theanine earlier tonight as a way of helping people sleep um, and maybe even helping with pain control. L-theanine is a chemical found in green tea. And when you take it, it's converted in the brain into a chemical called GABA. And GABA is useful at controlling pain. It also can help put people to sleep. It's useful at controlling anxiety. If you're going to use it for anxiety, you might want to take a 100 milligram pill, two or three pills, three times a day. It can help, okay? Another thing from a natural medicine standpoint that can sometimes help is to take nutrient doses of lithium. Yeah, lithium, all right? Now, lithium at high doses, many of you may be aware of, is something that we use for a psychiatric condition called manic depression, all right? But you can also use lithium at microscopic doses at five milligrams three times a day, when we, uh, at, which is a nutrient. It's used by the brain as a nutrient. Five milligrams three times a day is called lithium orotate. And if you use it, it can actually take the edge off. It helps soothe, it helps calm, okay? When we use, by comparison, when we use lithium for psychiatric conditions for like bipolar disorder, manic depression, we're usually going to dose it about 600 to 900 milligrams a day. Okay, so I'm talking about using lithium at a much lower dose. The lithium and L-theanine you can use in addition to the lorazepam that you're thinking about here too. Okay, there are just some thoughts for you. All right, Bob, good luck to you. <coughs> Excuse 
excuse me here, everyone. All right, I'm gonna take a follow-up question here from Deborah, and this will be quick. Deborah had asked me earlier tonight about stopping by X and, and what to do about the inflammation that might happen from that. So Deborah says, if I take the max dose of curcumin and Neclonia cava, would that mask symptoms of Lyme or Bartonella relapse symptoms? Um, no, I, I don't. If you're if you're getting into a true relapse, uh, Deborah, they will overcome your Echelonia and they will overcome. They will be more than the Echelonia and um, the um, curcumin can handle. Okay, so I don't think there's a risk of that. All right. Good luck, Deborah. All right. Hello, Kathy. Let's see. Received a tick bite 30 days ago, took doxy for 10 days. During the course, began having sweats and symptoms, increased to sore throat spasms, muscle stiffness, cramping in random places, air hunger, insomnia, vivid dreams, trembling, heart pounding, chills. This seems like Babesia. What treatment do you recommend? And so, um, Kathy, from what you've explained here, yeah, that does sound like Babesia to me too. That's what, as I'm reading, I'm thought, Babesia. Um, you know, so first of all, I, two things. Number one, 10 days of doxycycline is not enough to make sure that you're not gonna develop Lyme disease chronically, okay? So um, I would definitely see if you can approach your doctors to make sure that you get at least 30 days continuous use of the doxycycline. Um, there's good studies that show that that 10 days is not going to be enough. And in fact, even when we use the 30 days of, or, uh, two, the, of two weeks of doxycycline, you find that 20% of people still have symptoms after that treatment, all right? You need to get back on your doxycycline. And hopefully you find some doctor that will do that for you. Now, your doxycycline also will help treat that BZ. It won't get rid of it, but it's going to be useful. Help uh, will help it, Okay. So what I would use for the Babesia, what I like using, and you can find article, a whole article I have about the various ways to treat Babesia. But what I like using is Malarone. It's an anti-malaria medicine, um, among many things I like to use, but Malarone, and I would start at two pills twice a day for three days and then decrease it down to one pill three times a day. And with this, I would definitely make sure you treat long enough not to have your Babesia symptoms for at least two or three months. And in an acute setting, that may mean you only need to take this for two or three months, okay? Now, by comparison, when people get chronic Babesia, I'm usually going to treat for four or five months. I find that works better, all right? So if you're looking for options to treat your Babesia, let me just show you where you're going to find more detail than what I just said of all the treatment options. So you can bring this article to your doctor, lay it down on the table and say, I want this and I want this, okay? Let me show you that article because you can just print it off on your computer too. So let me go ahead and do a screen share here. All right, so I'm gonna go over to the Treat Line book. There's two things that you wanna look at to help your doctor, okay? You're gonna go into the chapter on chapters and you're gonna take a look at Lyme Disease 101 and you're gonna look at this chapter called How to Diagnose. And in here, there's an article about how to diagnose Babesia, print it out, bring it to your doctor. I make the case that you cannot rely on testing. You have to treat based on symptoms, okay? So bring this to your doctor, all right? Second article that you wanna take a look at is in the under the chapters tab, in infection treatment plans. Take a look at the article called Kills Babesia, a brief guide where I lay out many different options you have to treat Babesia, okay? All right, let me go back here. All right, everyone. So, Kate, Kathy, good luck to you. Um, I wish you well, and I definitely hope you can jump on that, especially with even getting more of the doxycycline as well, too, okay? All right? So everyone, that's that's it. That's an hour and a half of time um, of answering questions. I, I had a good time, but I need to get home. <laughs> I'm kind of getting burnt out from my day here. Besides my two Basinjis, my two dogs, my two faithful companions that have just been sleeping over on my exam table tonight are starting to stir because they know it's about time to go as well too. So I have to get them out of here. Um, tomorrow morning, again, around 6.30 in the morning, you should get an email from me that says things are ready and will tell you how to link 
to um, the, the, we'll provide a link so you can watch that recording again, okay, of the webinar tonight. Um, here in a second, I'm going to redirect everyone that's still here as part of this webinar um, back to treatlime.net, the, the treatlime book. Um, I would appreciate if you'd support the work we're doing. Every time you subscribe to the treatlime book, you get some great information, as you know. Also, you support these webinars, okay? And so the way to subscribe is try reading an article that says you have to subscribe and subscribe, okay? So click on that, that buy now tab that says subscribe. You'll find lots of helpful information in there and I'd appreciate if you do that. Also, when I redirect you to the Treat Lime, uh, the Treat Lime book site, um, look at the men navigation menu on the top and you'll see a link to the webinars. Through that, you can sign up for next week's webinar and I'd be glad to help you next week as well too, all right? So good night, everyone. Um, I wish everyone well, um, and I'm going to redirect you now.